If you've decided to learn ethical hacking, you may be confused with what to learn first. It can also be expensive to get started, so we want to show you the cheapest and most flexible way to begin learning the core skills of ethical hacking using a Raspberry Pi 3 running Kali Linux. When you're beginning to learn ethical hacking, the most likely operating system you'll be using is Kali Linux. Now, this is because there's a great community of beginners and other people who have already encountered most of the issues you'll probably experience, and as a result, there's a lot of help out there, both from different forums and from just a simple Google search. So to run Kali Linux, you'll need to decide if you want to run it as a virtual machine or if you'll want to install it on your hard drive. But in general, it's not a great idea to run a hacking distribution or something you're going to be downloading new unknown modules on and kind of experimenting on the system that you use for your kind of everyday life. Now, a much better idea is kind of segmenting that and installing it on a different computer, but not many people want to actually install like a new operating system in order to start learning about something new. Or actually buy a new computer in order to start learning about something new. So we're going to explore something a little bit that's kind of a compromise, uh, and that's the Raspberry Pi 3. Now, this is great for anybody learning about ethical hacking because it runs Kali Linux and allows you to kind of see this as like a Lego piece where you can build other things off of it and create what's kind of uh, like a prototype or an idea that relies on just plugging a couple of things into this and making it work. So that's really cool because it allows you to segment away all the experimental stuff you're doing from the things that you really want to keep safe. And if this were to get fried or if it were to become corrupted, you could just replace the SD card, reformat the SD card, or even just get a new Pi. They're cheap, so it doesn't really matter the same way it would matter if you were to mess up like a nice MacBook Pro or a nice gaming PC. So when you have one of these, you're going to need to pay attention to the SD card. Now the SD card is actually a micro SD card, this is just an adapter, and this is how small it really is. So this little SD card does matter, and you need to pick one that's at least 16 gigabytes, because if it's smaller, you can run into issues depending on what version or image of Kali Linux you're trying to install. Now this is a SanDisk Extreme Plus, and we recommend these because they're super, super fast and they work well with Kali. So if you're having an issue with your card and you suspect that it might be related to the speed of the, uh, of the card, maybe your operating system is too slow, uh, this would be something you could try to maybe see if that was the issue. Now, if you want to directly interface with your Pi, you're going to need to have some sort of interface device. And we recommend a keyboard like this, which is a little re keyboard we got off Amazon. In particular, the one with the little laser on it is really useful. Uh, there's some other brands out there. And this one uh, also gives the, the ability to connect via this little, you know, little uh, USB dongle rather than the advertised Bluetooth model, which we find did not work very well. Even though the Raspberry Pi does have Bluetooth, it is a nightmare trying to set up one of these keyboards with them. So we really recommend you just get the one that plugs in and doesn't advertise itself as Bluetooth, just from experience. Now, the Raspberry Pi does have Wi-Fi, but it's more like command and control Wi-Fi, where you can log into the Pi and tell it to do things. You should not be using the uh, internal card to do hacking stuff, because it's just not suited for it. Um, it doesn't have the right chipset, and you'll need something like one of these cards, either something like a, an Alpha card or a Panda wireless card. These cards all have the ability to go into monitor mode, uh, do things like packet injection, and they're really good because you can just plug them into the um, Raspberry Pi, running Kali Linux, and get started on most of the modules that you would use to hack Wi-Fi or do stuff over a network. So that's a really important thing to do if you want to get into uh, wireless networking or that sort of stuff with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you cannot use the internal card to do a lot of the stuff you'll want to do on Kali, so make sure that you know, uh, you know how you're going to continue your learning experience uh, with kind of what things you'll want to uh, install. Uh, Finally, the last thing you'll want to check out is the USB rubber ducky, because paired with the Raspberry Pi, when you add the twin duck firmware, you're able to plug this in, have it mount as a USB device, and you can actually SSH into your Pi from your phone or some other available device, write a new ducky script, convert it, drop it into the, into the duck, and on site be able to create your own payload within potentially a matter of minutes. 
So it's really cool because you can access the device, swap the payload, or even choose one of the pre-existing payloads simply by plugging it into the Pi and then connecting via your phone over Wi-Fi. So it's a really cool way for anybody who's getting into beginning hacking to learn about HID attacks, which is human interface attacks, like this USB rubber ducky that pretends to be a keyboard in order to execute code. And it also teaches you a bit about programming because you have to visualize the steps of what you want to do on another computer. And as a result, you'll end up uh, learning a little bit about how to abstract those steps, write them down into ducky script, and then watch them run on another machine. So all these things together are a great kind of setup because you can start to mix and match these things like a Lego set almost. And depending on what kind of prototype you want to create, you can just plug in a GPS unit and a wireless network adapter and suddenly have something like a war driving kit that allows you to drive around the neighborhood and detect all the wireless networks nearby as well as their location and security if uh, there's an issue there. When you first get your Pi, it may already come with Raspbian the official OS of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. While this is a great Debian-based distro, we need to install a lot of things before it'd be suitable for hacking. Now it's worth noting that if you do have a project you're developing on the Pi, switching to Raspbian from Kali can get hardware like Bluetooth working more quickly. Now Kali on the Pi has a few quirks, and one of those is setting up the Bluetooth. The best way we found to do this is to, uh, on the Raspberry Pi 3 and the Pi 0W is the Reason kernel. Now this is provided for download on the White Dome website at whitedome.com.au. Now once you're on the website, you can navigate to the Reason kernel section. So the kernel provides a number of streamlined setup tools that allow you to enable Bluetooth on the Raspberry Pi that normally takes a, a lot of configuration and headache and sometimes just straight up doesn't work. This allows nearly kind of on-off functionality to be able to pair any Bluetooth devices you might want to add. So to get started, you'll need to download uh, the official image from the White Dome website. So you'll navigate to the Reason Kernel section and scroll down until you see the link to the image that you are looking for. In this case, the uh, Pi 2 and 3 is what we are going to download, but you can also see above here, the Pi 0 and the Pi 0 W is listed as well. So by clicking on this image, you'll be redirected to the download page and see it has a 2.8 gigabyte image for us to download. And we've already downloaded that here, but if we wanted to proceed, we would just click on this and it would download our Sticky Fingers Kali Pi image there. So we'll proceed to our download folder since we already have it. And you can see this is the image that we will be loading onto our Raspberry Pi. Now, the way we'll be doing that is by using a program called Etcher. Now, Etcher is a program that burns bootable images to micro SD cards, and that's what the Raspberry Pi relies on in order to start. So we will open Etcher, which is free and cross-platform, and we'll need to identify the image that we want to burn. So we'll click on Select Image, and in our download folder, we'll have our Sticky Fingers Kali Pi build. And next, we'll select the SD card that we want to write it to. In this case, a 32 gigabyte SD card. Now you'll need to make sure that this is at least 8 gigabytes because anything less will not be able to handle an image of this size. So after confirming that you're not overwriting something, you'll be upset uh, if you erase. Make sure uh, to click the mass storage device of your choice and finally click flash in order to begin the flashing process uh, and it will ask you to authenticate here. Now, as this uh, flashing process proceeds, uh, it will go ahead and burn the image to the card and then validate it and then eject it so that you can put it into the Raspberry Pi and boot it into Kali Linux. When your Pi is connected, you'll need to plug in a keyboard and mouse to interact with it. A USB keyboard mouse combo off Amazon is often a good way to just plug in a little USB dongle and immediately get started uh, controlling your Raspberry Pi. Now you'll need this because the first thing you'll have to deal with is a little login prompt asking you for your username and password, which will be the same on virtually every, well, no, literally every Kali Linux distribution uh, when it first starts up. So it's going to be really important to make sure to change this because later on, anybody will be able to log into your Kali Linux instance or execute commands as root, uh, which is super, super not what you want. And in fact, most scripts will attempt to automate attacks like this uh, for people who do not change their default username. So make sure that uh, anything that you set up, you always check out and change the default password. So in Kali Linux, the default username is root. 
and the default password is tour, T-O-O-R, which is root backwards. And you can use this to go ahead and log in to the, um, the graphic user interface of Kali Linux. Now, this is how we're going to access it now, but in the future, you can choose to access it via VNC, which will share the screen over your phone screen or your um, computer screen, or SSH, which will just provide you a command line ability to control the tools in Kali Linux, which is actually usually enough. So go ahead and click on um, Use Default Configuration, and down at the bottom, you'll be able to click on the little terminal icon to open a terminal window. Now I'm gonna enlarge this a little bit so you guys can see a little better. And it's important to know uh, that there are four core things that we need to do in order to set up Kali Linux for general use. The first, as we already mentioned, is change the default password. The second is going to be to turn on the Bluetooth controller in order to scan uh, Bluetooth or find a device to pair, uh, like maybe another keyboard or a mouse or a, a let's say a, a speaker if you want to be able to project sound. So then you'll need to replace the SSH keys and update the permissions so you can use SSH to connect to your Pi wherever you are. Uh, this is super important because it's always a good backup option if you're using VNC and something gets messed up or if you need to log into the Pi and see what is going on. Uh, finally, if you're going to use SSH, unfortunately, you need to have the Pi boot up all the way and getting stuck behind the login portal, which asks you for the username and password, is unacceptable if you're out in the field. So fortunately, this uh, kernel that we're using comes with a really handy setup script that will allow you to set this up with only a couple little options and one quick reboot. So after we do that, we should have a Pi that's ready for hacking. So the first thing we'll do is type in password, P-A-S-S-W-D to change the default password, and we'll go ahead and change that now to something more secure. So it'll make sure that those passwords match, and then when it's done, it'll say password updated successfully. So next up, we'll need to set up the Bluetooth, which is pretty easily done. So in order to do that, I'll open a new desktop, and we'll type in Bluetooth CTL. This should start the default agent on Kali Linux, uh, or sorry, the default agent for the Raspberry Pi that controls the uh, Bluetooth card. Now, the next command we'll type is uh, agent on to make sure that the Bluetooth is turned on and then default agent to load the default profile. And once that's successful, we can go ahead and start scanning for Bluetooth devices around us with uh, just the command scan on. Great. So now as Bluetooth devices are discovered around us, they will start to appear here. And if we find the address of a Bluetooth device, we can just copy it and simply type pair and then the MAC address of the Bluetooth device, and it will automatically add that and attempt to pair it. Now we don't have any Bluetooth devices around us right now, which is fine because even if we did, they wouldn't be the kind that we could add. But in the future, if you wanted to pair something, here I'll just give you a random example. You could copy this, pair that, and you will watch it. Yep, it failed. Anyway, so that is how you can control the Bluetooth interface. If you try to do this manually by installing blues or other packages, it can be a little hairy getting started, but this will get you uh, started in just a couple of commands, which is very, very handy if you want to do some Bluetooth hacking or if you need to figure out how it works. So the next thing up is the SSH login. So in order to do that, you'll need to first change the default keys because it is super not secure to be SSHing into your Pi using the default keys because anybody can listen in on your conversation of what you're doing or even a uh, man in the middle or, or uh, do some other sort of attack. So to do that, it's pretty simple. Type dpkg-reconfigure and then open ssh-server. Now this will take a second as it generates new SSH keys. And when it does, uh, we will be ready to remove the old keys and start changing the permissions. So the next step is going to be to set this up so that we can use SSH whenever we log into Kali Linux. And the way we'll do that is by first removing the old keys by typing update rc.d tacf 
ssh remove. Once that command is run, we'll run a very similar command, but instead of remove, we'll type defaults. So you can generally hit up, which will bring up the previous command and save time. So once we do that, then SSH will be added to the defaults run level, and we'll be able to enable things like logging in via root. So that's important to run certain tools via Kali Linux, and uh, it's not usually enabled by default, uh, but we'll check it out and make sure that it is enabled because if it's not, it can be the root cause of a lot of problems. So go ahead and type nano and then slash etc slash ssh slash sshd underscore config. Now, once we're in here, we'll need to scroll down and look for the authentication portion. And we'll need to make sure that, here we go, the permit root login is untabbed. So it's, uh, that means a tab makes it so it's not read. Uh, this is untabbed, so it is being read. And permit root login says yes, as it does here. If everything looks good, you can uh, hit uh, control X and it'll e exit you out. Uh, and if you made any changes, it will ask you to confirm first. So finally, in order to uh, apply all these changes, you'll need to type sudo service ssh restart. That'll restart the SSH service and make sure that it uh, has applied all the changes we've set. Now the final command is going to be to, going to be to make sure that uh, the SSH persistence survives a reboot, so it'll restart with all the same settings that we put. Um, so we'll type again update rc uh, dot d tac f SSH and then enable two three four five. Now with that command, we've set up SSH so that as soon as we boot into Kali Linux, it should uh, immediately start running and allow us to connect via a root account and start doing all kinds of cool hacking stuff in Kali. Now finally, we need to take care of that problem with the authentication uh, portal, where as soon as we try to uh, log into Kali Linux, it stops us and asks us for our username and password before lo lo loading the desktop and doing things like connecting to Wi-Fi. Now, there's a handy utility that helps us take care of this, uh, where before I had to do a whole bunch of running around to different directories and changing different settings. So we'll use that uh, setup tool here instead of going the more confusing route. So go to cd slash usr slash local slash src slash re4son dash kernel, p-r-n-e-l underscore four and then an asterisk and that'll grab any whatever the latest version is uh, and search for whatever is in there here we go so we see 2018-0131 is the most uh, current version and that's what it finds so finally in order to set this option and be aware that this will cause a reboot um, so that's why we're doing it last you will type sudo dot slash re4son dash pi dash tft dash setup tac a and then root so this will allow auto login for the root account so the next step will be to press enter it'll ask if we want to enable auto login for user root and if we press yes it will immediately reboot to apply the changes and if we're successful we should have a pi that automatically logs in uh, starts SSH by default, and then is ready to be logged into and controlled remotely as soon as it starts up. So we're going to go ahead and press Y, and we'll reboot and see how it works. Now, if this works, we should have Kali Linux booting directly into desktop. And as you see, we did not encounter any sort of login portal. So we are directly in our desktop. Our SSH is ready to go. And the next step for you might be setting up VNC so you can see your graphic desktop from your phone or computer, which might be necessary for a script like Orgeddon or some other thing that's a multi-bash script that has to have several other windows open. Or you can offer a similar functionality through SSH and just stick to exploring the many different hacking tools Kali has to offer. 
So what can you make with the Raspberry Pi? Well, one of my favorite examples is the example of the Wi-Fi grenade. So this is a relatively simple configuration where you just add a wireless network adapter with a reasonable range, and you're able to control uh, the wireless network area of maybe a small house or a building. So what this does is builds a list of every single network uh, device that's broadcasting and then selectively de-auths every single one so that they can't connect to the network. Now something like this is a little bit smaller, but if someone made us really angry or if uh, we needed to go over a larger area for a penetration test, much more likely, then we can add a 2.4 and 5 gigahertz antenna. And then if they've made us really angry, we can create the Trident and add a giant 9 dBi network adapter like this. So this would have a monstrous range and be able to affect something over maybe even like a city block. Uh, so as you can see, by adding a couple things to the Pi, you can really scale up the power and create something just ludicrous, um, which sometimes is fun. So if we want to add something new, we can add GPS data to create a war driving Pi that allows us to drive around and find every misconfigured or, or poorly secured wireless network in an area very, very quickly, automatically. So war driving is uh, just having something like this in your car, driving around so that it can scan the area. And the end result is an interactive map where you can find anything that you're looking for in terms of weak security or open networks or anything like that. So having this in your backpack is a great way to simply walk around an area you're doing a penetration test in once and have a list very quickly of everything that's connected, even down to printers and things like that. Now, you might think that this is a little bulky, and you're right, but if you're doing something that requires a little bit more, um, I guess, lightweight applications, then you can rely on something like the Raspberry Pi Zero W. Now, my favorite payload for the Pi Zero W is acting as a mod, like an electronic weapons payload, I guess, for a drone by adding a wireless network adapter so that when you mount this underneath kind of a cheaper drone like this, you can fly up to a drone that's much more expensive and uses Wi-Fi to uh, communicate with its base station and actually hijack it by uh, sending a signal that de it and then pretends to be the wireless network that it was originally connected to in order to control it. So that creates a zombie drone that flies around this kind of cheap drone and you can force the drone that you're targeting to follow you back away wherever you want and uh, basically steal it if you wanted to. But it's a great proof of concept to show off that even a tiny drone like this can be outfitted with a little package that makes it so powerful it can take out even bigger, more expensive drones. So as you can see, the Raspberry Pi 3 and especially the Pi Zero W are very versatile hardware. And with the right configuration, you can really get creative and let your imagination come up with some really cool prototypes. The Raspberry Pi can help you learn about a lot of different ethical hacking skills. And anyone can get started without needing to risk their own system. With the Raspberry Pi running Kali Linux, you can learn about HID attacks, hacking Wi-Fi, and even tools like Metasploit in a matter of minutes. Thanks for watching this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.